Hello and welcome um, to tonight's webinar. Tonight's presenter is Dan Linus from Linear B, and he's joining us tonight from Los Angeles on the west coast of the United States. So uh, a very good morning to you, Dan. And you. Uh, we are going to discuss with you tonight uh, why Jira is good for product managers, but not for developers. And uh, looking very much looking forward to, to that. And um, with that, without further ado, over to you, Dan. And I will just disappear and see you on the other side. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm just going to share my slide deck here. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to be talking here about how Jira is great for product managers, but not so much for uh, developers. Um, and just a little bit of a background about me. So I'm uh, broadcasting here from Los Angeles. That's, that's where I live. Um, I'm one of the co-founders at Linear B, and we make a really interesting uh, product that connects Git and Jira related information and helps dev teams uh, deliver on their iterations. Um, I'm also the host of the Dev Interrupted podcast, which is something I do every single week. And what I'm really obsessed with is dev team culture. Now, my background before I was the co-founder uh, at Linear B is I'm a former VP of engineering. So at my last uh, job with, uh, we were actually acquired by Cisco. I had about 75 uh, members um, on my team. And my current role at Linear B is I'm leading our customer success organization. So I'm interacting with about, you know, 10, development teams every single week, you know, 500 to 1,000 development teams throughout the year. And one thing that they have uh, told me time and time again from a developer perspective is I dislike Jira or I'm not getting good value um, out of Jira. And I kind of dove in and I explored why is that happening? And I actually wrote, wrote a blog post about it. And that's how you know, I was invited to this uh, forum today. So what I'm going to be discussing here is there's three challenges that project management tools are presenting to dev teams. And I'm going to go kind of back and forth between the challenge that's being presented and some of the trends that we're seeing uh, with in our industry, as well as a few uh, proposed solutions. And maybe we can get to questions at the end here. So the first challenge that I'm seeing, you know, with Jira or any project management tool is they're really planned first. They're planned first tools and they're not development first tools. And I'll describe, you know, what that means. Um, if you look at on the right hand side here, if you think about the software development process, planning takes up a very small percentage of the process, maybe 15%. The actual development phase uh, is about 80% of the, the process, and maybe you have you know, 5 to 10% uh, at the end for retrospective. And these project management tools, they do really well in the planning phase, creating user stories, you know, setting the priority of our backlog, scoping an initial iteration. That's all good. The, you know, Jira does that great. But once development actually starts happening and tickets go you know, to an in-progress state, that's where we're getting some of this negative feedback that, hey, you know, this isn't really useful for developers. And it's also you know, not useful for an engineering team leader or a VP of engineering. A lot of the questions that you know, they'll get is around, okay, well, what does in-progress actually mean? Why are we moving slow? What work is really stuck and not stuck? We kind of see that everything is in progress, but when is it going to be delivered? Is it going to be delivered on time? And so, you know, what I found after kind of exploring this challenge is that one of the real issues that we're facing in our community is business leaders, they understand project strategy. So that's, you know, the, the product planning, the project planning but they don't understand product development as much. 
And this is where developers live. Projects are delivered with code. They're delivered with branches, pull requests, releases. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm a really, really big proponent of is explaining to product managers or to business leaders that are not technical, some of the really important delivery metrics or development metrics that exist within our industry that are not being shown today um, within JIRA or most project uh, management tools. So some of these, for example, are cycle time or mean time to restore or your PR review time or your time to deploy. These are kind of newer project delivery metrics that are super, super important. And some of the older ones, are, I'd argue, like a burn down chart, you know, that might be showed within JIRA. These don't, a burn down chart doesn't actually answer you the question, you know, when is the project going to be delivered? And so to kind of like su summarize um, um, the challenge here and, and what I propose, what I've been doing with a lot of software teams, some of them using linear B, some of them not, is to trade development transparency for dev process understanding. So what are we gonna do as a development community? We are going to go and educate our business leaders. We're gonna show more transparency in what, into the development process. That's branch creation. How long does that take? Coding time, cycle time, release and deploy. And what we're hoping to get in uh, return a little bit is an understanding from the business leader perspective, what really helps projects being delivered. The second challenge um, that I'm seeing when it comes to project management uh, tools is that they're kind of promoting or, or perpetuating this synchronous communication and not an asynchronous communication. And I'll explain what that means. Most of the developers that I have uh, worked with or who I'm interacting with, they want to work asynchronously especially with all the issues that are happening in the world today with COVID, more and more teams are going uh, remote. Developers want to be coding. Um, they don't like interruption. That's what actually delays uh, projects uh, from being delivered. And um, on the flip side, uh, product managers, they need to get updated on ticket status or the project status. What is the real state of the ticket? And this is an issue that we have right now or that what I, I'm hearing uh, issues uh, from JIRA. So some of the questions that a developer will get from a product owner is, hey, what is the real status of this JIRA ticket? I see that it's marked in progress, but have you actually started working on it? Are you almost ready to deliver? And they'll get that uh, interrupt, a developer gets that interrupt through a Slack message or even worse through uh, a formal meeting. And so the question you know, that you know, we really wanna ask ourselves is why are product managers having to ask these questions? If we have a project um, tool like JIRA or any other tool, shouldn't everyone be on the same page and be up to date? And we're not seeing that from the industry. Um, PM tools are rarely up to date. Um, they're missing a lot of context of what's going on behind the scenes. Um, and even if they are up to date, which takes developer uh, times, um, our dev community is still getting the, these interrupts hey, what is the real status? Or I have a question on this feature. So what I found is actually, you know, the real underlying uh, issue here is that project management tools do not accurately reflect the state of software projects when they are in progress. Software projects do not work in a very uh, just you know fluid motion of work not started, in progress, or done. Software projects, uh, the state of a software project can be really reflected from the Git process and also from the uh, release process. 
And this is what actually needs to be uh, visualized on a per JIRA ticket basis. How many branches are open per ticket? Are we in the coding phase? Are we in the review phase of the pull request? What has been merged? What has not been merged? What has been released to a set of customers? Uh, did the release go to all customers? Is it in a beta? Did it go fully live uh, uh, in GA? This is what's missing from most uh, project management tool setup and for most of the uh, development teams that I've been working with. Now, if we are able to uh, better visualize uh, per JIRA ticket, the actual Git status and release status, um, this allows for uh, a few things. One, it makes it very apparent what work is actually stuck um, and where the work really is within the iteration. Um, this allows PMs, uh, product managers or product owners to always know the true state of the ticket. It allows for product managers to interact with developers at the right time. Maybe it's actually time for a demo or maybe they've seen the code has been merged and now they can come in and say, hey, I'd like to work with you one-on-one. -on -one. I just saw that the code got merged for this particular story. And I, it, it's a great time um, to provide feedback. Um, on top of that, product managers, they have a different pain <laughs> than developers. Developers are always being asked for the status of the ticket. They're always being asked to update the ticket. Product managers on the flip side are always having to be the askers. And that's not what they wanna be. They don't wanna be hounding developers for status updates. Um, what they really want to be uh, doing is providing value to the developers uh, about the story or customer feedback or customer experience. But it's very difficult to do that today when they're just uh, looking at a traditional project management board. And so that, you know, relates to this third challenge, uh, you know, that, that I'm seeing here. Project tools create separation between engineers and PMs. Um, and I know that statement is a, a little bit controversial and it's supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to kind of ev evoke a response. Um, but here's kind of the, the thought process around that. The engineer and the product owner relationship um, is one of the toughest relationships to get right um, within an engineering or, or a software product delivery team. Each of those kind of have uh, uh, natural differences. Engineers are always trying to deliver on software, on code, on projects, you know, execute as fast as possible. PMs, you know, cannot get any of their work done without engineers. They cannot build their, their product dream. And that's why you kind of have this uh, natural tension. Um, and now the PMs at the same time don't want to feel like a babysitter always asking for that project status update. When is it gonna be uh, delivered? What's the state of it today? And on the flip side, you know, developers, they don't want to always having to be updating status within a, a JIRA, JIRA ticket. And so, you know, if I look at kind of some of the, the real issues that are happening, you know, within the industry around, around this area, we're seeing um, two things. One thing that we're seeing is project status, which I kind of mentioned in the uh, last uh, challenge. Uh, project status is not accurate. It's not always up to date. Um, developers feel that PMs are not providing them with enough uh, value and PMs are feeling like there's a lack of project transparency because they cannot tell what's going on. Now, this is solvable. I have a, have a slide of one thing that I'm doing with these teams and I'm working with to solve it. So that, that's kind of one issue that, that I'm seeing. And the other issue is a little bit more of an existential or higher level issue. Engineering is disconnected from the business. So 
what we want to do is kind of change that uh, dynamic within software organizations. Kind of a traditional model here is development teams hear decisions from business stakeholders who pass to uh, product and project managers that it then goes down to the engineers to do the work. And the status just from the uh, software engineers gets delivered back up. And that's not a flow or that's not a uh, productive chain to release uh, an elite software uh, uh, product. What we want to see is a little bit of a shift in the industry that developers uh, have more influence around this context. We can spend uh, less time asking for project status updates or when is something going to be released that should all happen automatically. And we can have more conversations around educating engineers about context uh, from the customer standpoint so they can make decisions on the fly. Um, and that's, you know, that's a real pain point within the industry. We do see that some of the best uh, software companies or product companies in the world um, are getting better at this, but most are still in this traditional model. Um, so when we think of uh, a few solutions to some of these uh, problems that I have been seeing, um, one thing is around teaching business leaders about the software development process. Um, there's a few really, really important metrics that I think every business leader should understand so they can stop asking questions about, okay, when is a particular uh, project or I'm looking in JIRA and I can look at, you know, okay, when is this iteration going to be done? Are we going to complete on time? We can change the conversation from that type of talk to what's the software cycle time? Where do we have bottlenecks within our delivery system? What's our mean time to this restore? How many, uh, uh, how much code churn do we have? That's the type of conversation that's actually interesting in order to deliver great software projects on time. Um, you know, kind of the, the second thing that we can do here is describe software projects in terms of get and release stages and not in terms of JIRA tickets. And I know that's a little bit new uh, to people, but here's how something like that can look. Um, and this is actually, to be honest, what my company uh, Linear B is focused on. If you have a view like this, you can see on the left-hand side, all of the stories and bugs and non-functional work that's supposed to be delivered within an iteration but if on the right hand side, you're lining up get related work and you're lining up release related work and you're uh, lining up, okay, uh, uh, pull request reviews and pull request related work, this is the true status of a software project. And this actually gives value to developers instead of just asking uh, developers to simply update, you know, a, a JIRA ticket status where they don't get um, a, a lot of value from. Um, some of my uh, uh, last slides here is um, definitely thank you for, for listening. Um, but when we talk about, you know, educating our, our business counterparts, our non-developer um, co counterparts, um, we actually have our, a metrics run book here that can get you up to date on what is cycle time and how do I describe that to a business stakeholder? or you know, what is uh, time to review? So you can find that there at linearb.io with our metrics run book. And just like a quick overview uh, of uh, what we talked about uh, here today. Um, we talked about how project management tools are planned first and not development first and some of that, the pains that it causes for product owners and developers. Um, we talked about how project uh, management tools kind of perpetuate this uh, synchronous communication, but not as much the asynchronous communication. And that's how developers really want to work. They don't want to get asked for that status update. And lastly, we talked about project tools creating kind of this or, you know, accentuating this separation between engineers and PMs. We want to shift the conversation from when is the thing going to be 
delivered or the feature being to, to uh, feature going to be delivered to um, let's have a, a business or a value conversation from the customer perspective and empower our developers. Um, so thank you very much for, for listening uh, to my talk here and some of the things that I'm seeing in the, in, uh, the industry. And, you know, I'm happy to uh, answer uh, questions if anyone has one for me. So um, there's a question in the chat and maybe we can pick that up first while I promote everybody to the panel. Um, the question is, so this is all mid sprint status. Yes, from Drew, I guess the, 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 the reason behind that question is that, of course, if the sprint is over and if you have your release at the end of the sprint, then all these questions disappear. So basically you have your, um, um, your sprint meeting at the end of the sprint and then you show what you have done during the sprint and then everything, everybody's happy basically because um, all these, uh, and, and during the sprint, you shouldn't ask anyhow. So that's because uh, you are in the middle of the sprint. Yeah, so here, here's what, what I'm seeing from the community. You kind of have like the idealistic way to run a sprint. <laughs> and then you have what actually happens in real life. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> maybe if you read the textbook of how to run a sprint, everything's perfect. There, you know, we line up our uh, stories that we want to deliver in the beginning. Everybody works perfectly. We release at the end of the iteration, perfect customer value and everything looks good. How many times does that happen? Very rarely. What actually happens a lot, you know, what I, I'm seeing with software projects is, first of all, some teams release uh, much more often, not just the end of a two week iteration cycle or, or a three week iteration cycle. A lot of the teams that are using Linear D, they're releasing almost every day, some piece of value, might be behind a feature flag, something like that. Um, and the other thing that we're seeing is we have teams on the other end of the spectrum. We're not completing everything within an iteration. We have a bunch of carryover work. Um, yeah, so I guess the way that I, I would answer that is there's kind of like the idealistic way to work and then there's reality. And what we're seeing from development teams is in reality, it's much more, the software process is much more complicated and it's harder to stay um, in sync with product management. Okay, so, yeah. um, and my follow-up question would be, doesn't a lot depend on how you define your work items? So to give you an example, um, we had in one of our previous webinars, we had Lauren Pai from SmartBear who introduced us to Cucumber for Jira, for example. So you do behavior driven development or you start with a domain driven design approach. And at the end, there's something in Cucumber. So you basically define a feature as a test um, and uh, this is your work item. Basically this feature is then your Jira ticket. And that is automatically a piece of code. Um, and you have negotiated that piece of code and that feature with your product manager, business owner, whatever, whatever you want to call him or her. Um, so the, um, then a lot of these problems wouldn't arise or is it just a, a problem of visualization that Jira doesn't give you the, the tools to visualize your, your status if you do not integrate it with Bitbucket, for example, or whatever, Bitbucket and Bamboo or Git and Jenkins, all that is possible. Well, yeah, why do you feel that the problem would not arise in that situation? Um, because then you're actually part of a Git flow at that moment, if you do it right, if you just write the cucumber, if you write the cucumber, if you version the cucumber in Git, that's the assumption. And that's also what Laurent showed us with this smart bear plugin. Um, then you're already in a Git flow, you're part of a Git flow. So somebody can, can create a pull request, can do that and merge it to the main branch, whatever, whatever Git flow you are using. And then um, you are in a Git flow. Yeah, yeah. Um, here, here's what I would say to that. I have seen a few plugins uh, for Jira 
that can expose uh, branches or some type of association to the story. So I think that's what you're getting at here. No. Um, a majority of the teams that I've seen are not set up well in that way that are working in the world. They don't have that good correlation between branches and PRs and releases. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess if you put in you know, a lot of effort and make sure that you have these concise workflows, we have this plugin, everything is fully automated, maybe, but most of the teams are not even close to that uh, situation. And that's where a lot of the problems arise. Um, and then the other side of that is kind of the communication with the business. So let's say that you do have, you know, good branch correlation back to your stories and something like, you know, like that. And you're getting, you know, questions, well, okay, well, why is this project, you know, late or what's stuck and, and what's not stuck? I haven't seen out of JIRA or project management tools, any metrics being exposed that can actually, you know, uh, speak to that. What's okay. the cycle time? What's the mean time uh, to restore? What's our deployment frequency? That's the conversation that, that you need to have. And that's, uh, yeah, yeah, regarding cycle time or process or whatever you want to call it, that's the same criticism that comes from um, Kanban. Uh, theoreticians let's put it that way uh, or from the true kanban people they also say jira cannot do kanban because you miss that metric can i expose that metric uh, at least not uh, really um i have two questions in the chat a big metric during a sprint is agile velocity do you track that using jira or how do you feel about it i have some strong feelings about agile velocity um, I actually wrote, wrote a blog about this. Mm -hmm. So let me try, try to put this uh, nicely. I'm a proponent for agile velocity and tracking velocity if the metric stays within the development team that is tracking it. Meaning it's only talked about within the development team that's using it. It's, um, it's not a performance metric by any means. It, to me, it doesn't show if you're moving faster or slower or something like that. Um, it's used for capacity planning. That's why I, why I like Velocity. Now I've worked with a lot of software teams that have tried to use Velocity as a performance metric and they might, you know, expose that metric um, to um, their boss or some, you know, an executive team or something like that. That's where things go really, really bad. <laughs> um, what happens in that situation, because we all know uh, velocity is subjective, you start having developers on the team kind of not lie, but change what is a five point story versus a four point story versus a three point story. We start using this, you know, to say how fast or how efficient is the development team. Um, and I don't like that, that those are really negative behaviors. To, so to summarize, you know, with velocity, I like it for capacity planning within a sprint. I like it if it stays within the development team is not, and it's not exposed. For all other uses, I'm not a fan of, not a good perform uh, metric to track. Okay. Um, and the other point, the question, I mean, that in the next question, I think goes in the same direction. Um, I also think that this is an ideal with very short cycles and small independent work items. The whole question on how far a feature is, then again, is then again visualizable in the PM tool, right? Hmm. Yeah, let me, I, I kind of understand the question, but let me yeah. try to just hear what I, I'm hearing from the community. A lot of the teams will kind of have a basic JIRA workflow setup. So you might have, you know, not in progress, in progress, maybe you have something like in QA and then done. Okay. T typically. Now, 
let's say that a feature is in progress. I don't have much visibility as a development team and I don't have much visibility as a product owner of how far along in progress is it really? Is it in progress that we just started coding on it and you know we get, it's actually going to be delivered two weeks from now or is it in progress where we actually have 10 branches that are still open three of them have been merged maybe one small piece of work ha has been deployed and that's the true you know state of the uh, feature now, I've seen people try to use uh, JIRA or project management tool to get more detailed and start adding different uh, stages to the workflow. So, okay, we're going to have in, we're going to have, you know, research, then we're going to have in development, then we're going to have, you know, pending uh, QA review, and then we're going to have pending uh, product owner review, demo, then release. This just totally clutters kind of that simple workflow that I'm actually more of a proponent for. And it puts more of the burden back on the developers to go and update, you know, the JIRA ticket status. And that's where you get kind of this more of a complaint cycle that either all the tickets out of date because it's not in the right piece of the workflow or developers saying, why am I always just updating JIRA ticket statuses? Okay. Um, and another question here from the chat, the problem you mentioned that business leaders do not understand software development. What is the root cause of this? Why don't they understand? Are developers not being promoted to business leaders? Um, where does this knowledge gap come from? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. So whoever the asked other that, thank yeah, you. The, <laughs> I would have a follow-up question for that. Um, do they need to understand developers? <laughs> okay. Be my follow-up question. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think there's a few things happening here. So first off, first of all, this is not always the case. We have, you know, companies like Facebook and Google, where you have, you know, essentially developers who became the CEOs or some of the business leaders, right? And you maybe don't have that, that problem. But there's a few things that kind of come to mind of, of why this is uh, uh, the case. Oftentimes you'll see, you know, a CEO or you have like the VP of product, the VP of customer success, the VP of sales, and maybe one person like a VP of engineering, a CTO at, at the uh, executive table that is technical. Most of the other, you know, business leaders do not come from a technical background. So they kind of don't have that inherent uh, background of, okay, what does it really take to create a product from an engineering standpoint? So there's a little bit of a disadvantage there. I think that then leads to uh, questions that are non-technical, but more just when is the feature going to be delivered? That's the only thing I know how to ask. When is the product going to be released? When is this customer success issue going, going to happen? Um, I feel like it, it is kind of on us, like the developer community to give the business leaders a chance and to start talking about things like cycle time, investment profile, code churn, uh, bottlenecks within the delivery organization. What I've seen is when those conversations do start happening at the executive or the management um, table, um, non-technical people can understand that. Very, very smart people. Mm. And what that then uh, leads to is a better conversation. So for example, if you're someone on the technical side and you're saying, hey, you know what? We need to do a lot of non-functional work in order to release faster. That conversation in order to improve our cycle, cycle time, that conversation goes so much better when there is kind of that, that education that's being provided from the dev side to uh, the managers. I know that was a, a long-winded answer and I think you had a follow-up question as well <laughs> that I forgot. You know, I could I could say um, I could say um, well I'm a customer so if I go to a tailor I want a new suit 
I don't have to have the slightest idea how you do that. Um, I'm just interested in the end result. That's a suit. And you as a tailor have to tell me, hey, do you want that double breasted or a single row? Do you want to have a, a special pocket for your uh, phone or do, don't you want that? And we can do that on the left or the right. Would you like to have that on the left or the right? That's your job as a tailor to get that out of me, to get, to get, to get me the product that I, that I, to describe the product for you in your terms. So why do I have to understand what you do? I do understand, have to understand the basics and I have to trust you that you know what you are doing, but at the end of the day, I'm the customer. You are delivering a service in a way. Yeah, I think like that, that mindset is actually more describes what we don't want, right? So, you know, that, that mindset's kind of saying, well, engineering is separate. Engineering is not part of the business. Mm -hmm. Engineering is just, hey, you know, I'm the business leader and I tell engineering what to do. And they're the ones that go and figure it out. And they just, you know, whatever they do, it's behind the scenes, it's magic, I don't care. No. That's not a healthy business in 2020. A lot of businesses within 2020 are product-led companies. The yeah. product okay. really matters. And, okay. you know, if we understand what we can do from the business perspective to help engineers do their job better, that's what we need to enable. And that was kind of a, yeah, you kind of described the challenge I was seeing and kind of the movement that I, I'm trying to evoke. To give you a counter example, I, I had a, several workshops with Alberto Pandolini who vented event storming. Um, and event storming, there's this high level event storming where you do along the timeline with all the orange sticky notes and everything. You talk with the business owners that they describe your, their workflow in their language and everything. But beyond a certain point, when he starts breaking that down into stuff that becomes code, that becomes architecture, he himself says, beyond this line, I do not want to have you because here I am developer. You do not tell yeah. me if I do that in Java or if I do that in a MySQL database. You yeah. describe what features do you have. You, we, we together break down the features into manageable chunks uh, and, and normalize that. But beyond a certain point, I'm a developer and you not, do not tell me how I do that. And I do not tell you how do you do your, how do you, how you do your business and you do not tell me how I develop your software. Yeah. That's the, the... And, that, and that's fair. That's why, you know, it's kind of like that yeah. fine line of how much, how much details do you expose at what level of the business? So when I'm working with development teams and when I think of a, a product delivery team, I'm saying, you know, the engineers, the product owner and the scrum master, right? These are all, all people that are tightly working together on a small team unit. Mm -hmm. um, through Linear B, when we've exposed, for example, uh, the branch related work, uh, the branch related visibility, the, um, pull request related visibility, the release related visibility, product owners have said, oh my God, thank you so much. I can now ask the right questions at the right time and I can stop you know, bugging developers. This is amazing. Now, would I take that same level of detail and use it in an executive meeting? No, <laughs> that's okay. not the level of detail. I don't need to know if you're <laughs> ever working in Java or Python or something like that. But at the executive level, again, there's some of these high level metrics that describe it. It's actually describing how quickly the business is operating. That's how much, again, I'll go back to cycle time. That's an executive level uh, metric that can be understood. You don't have to understand branches and PRs and blah, 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 blah to understand that. So yeah, I think it's just the right information at the right level. Okay, so, but then there is a certain separation of information that I as a customer do not need. I do not need to know how you sew my suit. I just need to know that I need a suit and what it looks like. You know what's fun, funny about that too? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we at, at Linear B, like we're, we're pretty close with our customers. So our, our customers are engineering or organizations and this could, you know, be why. And, and I, I agree with you, you don't always need to know how the sausage is made, right? 
Um, but what we ha have seen is the more that you expose about really where a feature is to a customer, you get so much great, great feedback. <laughs> yeah. So again, I think it's kind of like that, that fine line, like, Hey, you know, we actually have a demo of this. It's not ready to be released yet. Do you want to come see it? Our customers come and say, yeah, actually we've never been invited to a demo. This is cool. Yeah. yeah. Be because I'm kind of in that position that I'm, I'm not a practical person. I have a theoretical understanding about what developers do and what development is but I couldn't write, I, it would take me a day to write three lines of code. So I'm not yeah. productive and I'm not practical. And I, and I haven't <laughs> been allowed to touch a machine since 1989 because productive machines break when I touch them. So that's, uh, so that's why I'm a theoretical person and not practical. Um, so I have an understanding, but I cannot do it. And that's why I always trust the developers to, um, to get their job done at the end of the day. And I know Absolutely. what to ask at the right point. Um, I would like to ask a question um, about visualizing cycle time. Um, could you elaborate a bit on, on your definition of cycle time in the context of Git and in the context of software development? What, what does that mean for you? Yeah, so I've kind of heard um, two different ways to visualize um, cycle time. One of them is from the project standpoint, and that's not the one that I'm going to talk about most. But yeah, you know, story starts development and when does it, you know, finish within the project management tool. I'm not a big fan of that, but that is one way to do it. The way that we're visualing, uh, visualizing cycle time from an engineering standpoint is from coding starting on a branch until deployment to production and a few stages in between. So the stages in between are as follows from when coding be begins on a branch until the PR is initiated for review. Mm -hmm. Um, from PR initiated until when the first person uh, or the first developer starts the review process. So they're starting to give feedback to the original developer who opened the PR. Um, from review start until merge of the uh, branch and then from merge into release. And that's how we define cycle time with those little fragments in between. Um, and what we've seen, you know, this actually, you know, helps our customers with it identifies bottlenecks within the dev delivery cycle. Um, some teams, you know, have a little bit of a bottleneck in the PR review cycle. Some teams have a bottleneck in the deployment cycle. It all depends on each team. Um, but that's what that, that's how we define it. And that's what that visualization exposes. Okay. So do you include in that, um, say autom automatic information like uh, successful builds, successful automated tests? Is that part of that visualization or that cycle? Yeah. So the cool thing, and I should have said about why I like this cycle time better than the pro the story cycle time, the story yep. cycle time takes a manual update. Typically, unless you're set up perfectly, a manual update, someone has to go and move it from stage to stage. Mm -hmm. um, the, the cycle time that I'm describing just happens naturally as developers are working. Again, they want to work asynchronously. That's the whole point, right? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of um, successful builds and that type of stuff, uh, what we've done is allowed uh, engineering teams to let us know certain stages. So for example, you know, they can add into their cycle time successful build or stage build or release. Um, and they let us know that there's a few different methodologies. The most common is using a Git tag. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So um, one of the biggest, so when I, when I hear about Jira as an anti enter pattern, uh, normally, um, and I hear about it often. Uh, it mostly has to do with um, stuff like um, a Jira ticket has only one owner. So there's only one assignee in a Jira ticket, which is uh, 
antithetical against pair programming or whatever, whatever you do. Um, how do you uh, how do you handle that? Um, can you visualize something like that? So actually, this this feature is developed now by yeah. Tom, Dick, and Harry, who do mob programming or whatever. Or this is um, yeah. So <laughs> here's the thing: I don't think that Jira is an anti-pattern. First of all, I just yeah, think that but... it's made more for planning than it is for execution. That was like my whole whole talk. But yeah, within within Linear B, we automatically visualize that for you. Um, and if you know two developers are working on a particular piece of code, we actually just show show that uh, in our pulse view. Because that is always also a business question. Because Jira tells you that Tom is is the assignee for ticket A. Um, and you ask yourself, what are Dick and Harry doing who are part of the same team if they are working together on that uh, that problem, or that feature or whatever? Yeah, so you, usually it, some of it's a business pr uh, question, but some of it is just like an individual team operating uh, in a healthy way. So okay. for example, you know, if I have, Dan has eight branches open, because again, I like describing software projects through Git. I have eight branches open. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of workload on, on me. Mm -hmm. Who cares how many tickets are assigned to me at that point? I have eight branches that I'm working on in parallel. Yeah. And you know, Sally, you know, she she has one. Maybe there's an area that we can, you know, distri distribute the work or or something uh, like that. Um, I, I like to look at the enterprise term as like resource allocation, but it's okay. This is very tactic, right? Within an iteration. Okay, questions in the chat. So you split the metric on Git tag while the control chart in Jira has to include all of them without differentiation on successfulness and size of tickets. Do is that a statement or a question? Uh, that's the question, Frank. Is that a question or a statement? It was just uh, how how much I understood it. So it sounded like you you uh, split uh, the uh, function like the control chart in Jira, where you can get like the lead time and kind of like circle time. Um, with successfulness, we are the the git tags, if I understood it correctly. Why why the the control chart in Jira uh, can only show uh, for the whole project and for the whole sprint. So you can get like more on how long does a successful uh, implementation of a feature take into production? Yeah, so there's like, there's kind of two view views. Um, one view is how long does a feature take, like you were saying, to go end to end from start to finish? That's one view. The second view is how quickly are we able to deliver small pieces of work, in this case, branches from start to um, uh, release to production? And for example, a feature might have many, many uh, branches that makes up its cycle time. I hope I, I'm explaining it well, but there's kind of, yeah, Frank, there's like the project management view end to end time, and then the development view. And actually what enables software projects to be delivered more consistently on time, more predictably is that second view. How quickly are we able to go from coding to release? Do you have like for the branches you mentioned, do you have just like a, okay, this is, this is like an open branch, this is like a closed branch or a comparison or do you have like actually a count uh, because like uh, I used to to have like not many branches just per uh, separate repo um, for for a ticket, um, and I'm just like curious that you can like reach uh, what okay there are eight open branches but you maybe need fifteen uh, so and you they are not even created all at once maybe yeah yeah that that's a the, a good question and Frank I'd love to follow up with you to show you kind of what we're doing here. Um, we are tracking the open branches, right? We're not like, uh, can't do like pre-cog and uh, track the branches that are not created yet. 
Um, sometimes we're able to see that from like a, a subtask or something like that, but no, you know, we can only track the branches that are, that are open. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for the questions. Hubert. I have a question. So from my perspective, like, and from your clients, how does it work mostly? Because for, for us, of course, we need to track everything in Jira. But if you would like to also use your tool, so I should integrate with the Jira or they should like update all the stuff in linear B plus Jira or what's the typical like usage, especially for the bigger clients? Yeah, great question. So the way that we uh, built linear B, we know all the data in the world, of course, is stored in Jira or it's stored in one of the Git systems, right? GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab. Um, and so the way that Linear B works is we just integrate through API to those two systems, project management like Jira or the Git. Honestly, it takes like five minutes. You just click accept, accept, like if you accept the, the OAuth and we start pulling data. We pull data from your Jira system. We pull, pull data from your Git system. And we create some of those views that I, I, I was showing. Um, so yeah, because one of our principles, we don't want you to have to input any data to get up and running within Linear B. It just happens automatically. And again, our philosophy is software development is really done with in Git and with releases. And we need to expose that visibility and translate it back to projects. Okay. And that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, that's cool. Thanks. For I, have, yeah. I have another one. How do you uh, support it behind uh, the firewall? So on private cloud? Yeah, so we do have an on-prem version and we have a, a cloud version. Um, for our on-prem uh, uh, solution, um, we'll, we'll need a whitelist through that um, firewall, uh, an IP whitelist. Um, it's it's still a uh, uh, self setup. We have like a little interface that tells you if we were able to connect or get get through the the firewall or not. Um, but if you're in the cloud, then there the, you don't need that whitelist. Yeah, they're just like for for us, uh, Jira and Git is behind the firewall, so we are like in our close setup almost. Yeah, we have a ton of customers. That's the same situation again we kind of just need access into your uh system and uh, usually that's done through ip whitelisting okay cool yeah. cool um robert if you don't have another question i have one from the chat um regarding code rework if this metric is too high i am not sure what the countermeasure would be of this it would depend on what the purpose of the development organization is. Maybe there's a junior dev who is not as knowledgeable working on it. How do you isolate what the countermeasure should be, especially as a business owner who doesn't know anything about the development organization? And that's somebody who's reading your book on your website. Yeah, I guess people are going to the, <laughs> I was gonna say, I don't think I talked about code rework. Okay, yeah, but yeah. That, that's oh. a quote, direct quote from your book. So live reading basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll try to try to answer that quickly here if, if I can. There's a few kind of code churn uh, metrics that, that are interesting. One of them that we call is rework, which was brought up here. And one of them that we call is refactor. And then we have new code. So new code, refactor, and reworking. Reworking is when I've changed code uh, that was recently released to production. That's the idea of it. I'm already changing code um, that was just released to production. Now, of course, all development teams are going to have rework. You have to have rework. And what our community does with, with rework is every team is different. So, you know, depending on where you are with your uh, project lifecycle, um, Dependent, you might have a project that's been in production for 20 years. You might have a new project that you're trying to get, get released. We like to look at these as trends over time. So is my rework increasing and increasing and increasing 
uh, that's a good indicator to have a discussion around that. It could mean that, well, you know, our architecture and these few uh, repos or our general architecture, it's causing us to have to redo this code over and over again. That's a good discussion to have. Um, on the flip side, what I've seen sometimes from the uh, uh, PM side, it could be an indicator that there's confusion around stories. The stories weren't descriptive enough or redoing this work again over and over again. Now, what we've seen is uh, there's a correlation between companies that have the best cycle time. They usually have a rework percentage within 11 to 15%. I'm not saying that's what every developer, uh, every development team needs to do, but that's just some of the data. Um, so yeah, every, every development team is different and you need to, it's the trend is more important than the number. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have a question following up, follow up, a follow up question to that. It sounds like that the data you are visualizing and collecting is, is actually quite a quite useful for retrospectives for example so to to communicate this is yeah. here, here these, are, these are our bottlenecks and where does this does this bottleneck come from what can we improve or why did this happen why do we have so much rework and all that stuff do you have any let's say guidance or best practices for how to use your tool in retrospectives Oh, wow. Yeah, there's a lot. So here's the trouble. Usually if a retrospective isn't going well, it sounds something like this. This iteration sucked. <laughs> I was yeah. really uh, sad about this iteration. We didn't deliver on time. Like, can we just do better? Please, let's do better. That's that's a bad retrospective. <laughs> yeah, that, usually, that's based on feeling, but with your tool, I can base yeah, it on data. This, yeah, this usually, iteration sucked because I had 25% rework. According yeah, to <laughs> um, so yeah, if you bring data, team-based data, if yeah. you bring team and iteration-based data into your retrospective, it helps a lot. Um, for example, if we were looking at um, cycle time and we saw that our PR review time in the iteration was actually three days or four days. And we heard, hey, we did not complete all of our stories this iteration. Why did that happen? Well, you can look at some data, you can bring that to your retrospective and say, you know what? We have three to four days that we're either waiting to start a PR review or that we're actually reviewing. And we see that the branch whip for each person on the team averaged about five branches at a time. Mm -hmm. This indicates that no one was available to start these reviews. We're taking on too much work for the next iteration. Let's take on less work and let's focus on this bottleneck within the cycle time together as a team. And then we can see if it gets better next iteration throughout the trend. Like that's an effective retrospective meeting in my opinion. And yeah, Linear okay. B will help you do that. So can you, um... Do you have some, that's, that, that would be the, the second part of my question. Do you have some material to teach that, how to use your data, you know, correct, so how to interpret that data, yeah, especially, have... especially for the non-developers, so that you do, that, that you basically have these indicators and you can interpret them correctly? Yeah, for sure. I don't know what's the best uh, forum for, for that here. Um, I have Nico who's uh, listening in here. If there's an area that we can post some of our uh, educational material or something like that, we have a bunch of uh, written material on that. Send me the links. I will include them in the show notes and in our archive. Okay. And, I, yeah, and I'm referencing I all the stuff. So if that is, if these are URLs, just send them to me with the slides and I will include them in the archive and in the follow-up documentation. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Um, because that would probably be the best thing. And I will also yeah. include your metrics book in the- Right. Um, if you to... do go to our website, you can try Linear B for free. It's, yeah. There's a free forever version. And when you're in the product, Every metric that we have, you can click on the metric and it will say like, here's how to use it. So that's another way to do it, but I'll send, send you the links too. Perfect, perfect. Do you, sorry for interrupting. Uh, do you um, recommend having 
also um, person-based or role-based, um, let's say metrics. For example, like you mentioned, like, oh, we have, we don't have like enough people for reviewing code or uh, that, that particular person is like, maybe has regarding uh, good and bad days at, at work has like uh, this lead time while this person who's like a highly trained senior has like a shorter time uh, maybe to, to indicate like more, um, let's say courses, trainings, uh, whatever to improve uh, someone. Yeah, um, we definitely do. So I kind of reiterate that all of our metrics are team-based metrics, uh, which means how is the team operating as a team? But we do also have individual-based metrics that are oriented back to the team. So they're never about the performance of the person, but for example, you know, there will be metrics about Dan and it will say something like, well, how many uh, reviews was Dan able to get to this week? PR reviews, for example. If you're showing that on a per person basis for the team, it can kind of also show who was more freed up, who's not as freed up, who might need a little more training or education for some of the juniors um, and that type of stuff, Frank. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, so a lot of good, good metrics there, but they're always to help the team deliver, not lines of code or something like that for an individual. It's not as, as interesting. Cool, so it's, it's best like to, to have it or to have like a step in between and have it like per role, uh, for example, like deaf, junior deaf and- uh, Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Um, we show things like how many re repos they're contributing and that type of thing. Uh, but right now we don't have like a senior versus junior indicator in the system. Um, we find that most uh, engineering managers um, kind of know who's who <laughs> in their <laughs> small team. <laughs> no. Yeah, do you, do you also like... Um support like uh, pointing out silos or is that more on the Git side on contributors for orgs and repos? Uh, for example, like uh, developer A is just uh, writing code and reviewing code on that particular repo uh, while another person or team member has never touched it. Yeah, we'll, we'll show where the uh, effort contribution, the code contribution is happening per person. Cool, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I see nothing in the chat and nothing in the QA. Going once, going twice, and gone. So with that, Thank you very much. Have a very nice day. Um, and thank you for this analysis. I liked it a lot. And I'm going to take a closer look at Linear B. Awesome. <laughs> and follow up. <laughs> um, if anybody wants to, if it's OK, uh, I will handle. If anybody wants to, uh, wants to be put in contact with, with uh, Dan, is that OK if I forward your email address to people yeah, who contact absolutely. me? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And just want okay. to say thank you for having me. I know the topic was a little controversial, but I think we had a great discussion around it. I was happy to be here. Yeah, so it wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't controversial. I mean, it was very okay, constructive. Good. So uh, <laughs> because I, al I also do not like these uh, JIRA as an anti-pattern discussions without any, any uh, connotation or whatever, because it isn't. It is a tool and you have to use it correctly. And you showed us how That's to right. use our tool correctly. <laughs> so you made us better tool users. Perfect. Awesome. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. And hope to see you soon in the real somewhere, maybe, hopefully. And until then, stay safe, stay healthy, have a very nice day and happy holidays, whatever holidays you're celebrating. <laughs> okay. See you around. Good evening. Bye.